sorry, it's a little bit cosier than it was. Um, so, uh, thanks, Pam, for that, and thank you all for being here. I, I'm a, a, a translator. I, I'm in a slightly strange position, I guess, where um, for the last five or six years, I've worked quite a lot as a translator, and I've also worked for longer than that in the world of children's books, editing, reading guides, and reviewing books, and um, as Pam said, just kind of chairing events with writers and that kind of thing. But until very recently, I haven't brought those two parts of my work together. Um, we publish, again, as Pam mentioned, very, very little in translation for children in the UK, even compared to what we publish for grown-ups, which is not an enormous amount. Um, but the market for children's publishing is even more kind of insular and kind of hermetically uh, kept apart from the rest of the world and the adult market. So I've only recently begun to find opportunities to, to bring my translating work and my children's book work together. It's something I've always wanted to do because they're two things that excite me and the opportunity to translate a children's book itself is, is, uh, is a huge treat. I've only, um, I translated a, a very peculiar picture book, um, I think wonderful but very peculiar picture book a few years ago called Happiness is a Watermelon on Your Head, um, of which all I can say is that the title, Happiness is a Watermelon on Your Head, is maybe the least weird thing about this book, <laughs> um, just to give you some idea. I've translated some uh, short uh, kind of chapter books for younger children. I've just done a, a YA novel, but it's still a relatively new part of my part of my work. One of the things that was quite interesting, I thought, about that picture book in particular was, in fact, the thing that made me able to translate it. It was a, it was a sort of translation. It wasn't even my translation. But the thing that made me able to translate it wasn't so much having the two languages. It was having some understanding of the way a picture book works. And there is something to be said, I think, for understanding especially for picture books, understanding the form, um, understanding the way the architecture of a picture book works, which is not the same way as the architecture of a novel or the architecture of anything else. So I, I think it's been quite interesting from my point of view to see the ways in which um, I'm not sure I could have translated for children if I hadn't understood children's books. But with the, I can't quite express this properly, but with, sort of with a completely different bit of my brain. There's a bit of me which is, has begun over 10 years to understand how children's books work architecturally, formally, in terms of tone, in terms of pace, in terms of shape, but it's somehow been a completely separate part of me and it's now beginning to translate them. Um, and so it was, it was a, a delight and an interesting challenge to translate uh, this book. Can I tell you about this? Um, so it works, it works, <laughs> it's not there and everything. Um, so this book is called El Cuento Fantasma, which means the, the ghost story. Um, and it's a book about a book. It's about a book in a library who is, and I say who rather than which because it's a very personified book, it's a book in a library who is uh, very anxious and doesn't want to be read. And the book doesn't want to be read for two reasons. One is because he is very nervous about what happens when he is finished. What happens when someone gets to the end of the story? What happens to him then? And he's also very anxious because he thinks that there is actually nothing in him. There is nothing on those pages. The pages are completely blank. And this is, as it were, our main character. A blank, anxious book. Um, they're all weird picture books, aren't they? Um, and what happens in the story is uh, a girl comes into the library and starts talking to the book. And reassures the book and persuades the book that it's okay for her to read it and persuades the book that isn't it wonderful because when you get the story you can always start again and again and the story never goes away and also she discovers that the pages are not blank the pages have braille they have a story in braille and she can read the book but she reads braille rather than reading uh, ink um, so it's it's a very lovely, very unusual, beautiful, touching story. Um, written and illustrated by uh, Hamid Gamboa and Wensu Chen, who are Costa Rican. Published first in Guatemala, with extraordinary illustrations, and they're kind of conceptually very unusual, because they're mostly white, with little bits of color and a sense of texture to them. But it's a story which you publish in a Braille edition or a joint edition, but also you read it sort of apart from those things, you read it because it's a lovely story, because it's original, because it's, um, it's, 
it's a beautifully written thing. It's, it's beautifully kind of constructed as most picture books. The good ones are not just bits of writing, they're bits of construction, the way in which the, the words work on the page and work in relation to the pictures. It was, I was going to say it wasn't difficult to translate, it's completely not true. Um, but it wasn't difficult to translate because of the kind of book it is, or because of the subject matter, or because of the language, as it were. Um, it was quite a difficult book to translate because um, it's very good, <laughs> and because it's very delicate, and there is the aspect of you know words having to work with the pictures and how many people these things in mind when you're translating. But actually, there is nothing inherently difficult about it except really good writing where words are very carefully chosen, where the pace is very precise, all of those things um, are a particular challenge. But those are also the things that make it uh, pleasurable. I think the things that make good books difficult to translate are also things that, I think that's also why we 